Hello, welcome everybody to the National Museum of American Jewish Military History. Uh, what we do here is try to tell the stories of Jews who served in the American military, what they contributed to our country and, and the stories behind their service. I'm Mike Rugel, I run the museum's programs and uh, it's our pleasure to welcome today Frank Lavin to talk about his new book, Home Front to Battlefront, based on the letters of Carl Lavin. Uh, Frank has had a long career in government going back to the Reagan administration. He's served as the uh, U.S. Ambassador to Singapore. He's currently a living in Singapore and an expert on e-commerce in China. Uh, the project that brings him here today is Home Front to Battlefront. And looking at this book uh, based on Carl Lavin's correspondence, uh, it's very interesting. One of the frustrating things as a historian about reading wartime correspondence is so many of these folks that were in the middle of combat, in the middle of the battlefield, wrote home letters home to their mom that said things to the effect like while they're in the Battle of the Bulge, Belgium is beautiful in the snow. <laughs> you know, uh, uh, so, much letter, so many letters home are designed to make the family at home feel better. And we do see some of that in Carl Lavin's correspondence. But what I want to congratulate Frank Lavin on is, is the tremendous amount of research he put in to supplement those letters. So you do see exactly what was going on as Carl is fighting his way through Europe, as he's serving in Europe. So it's not just uh, the letters designed to make his mother, his Jewish mother, feel better. I don't know if Jewish mothers need more comfort than other mothers. Sometimes <laughs> I think they might, but I, I don't, haven't done the, uh, don't have the data on that for sure. But this uh, interesting World War II career of a young kid still basically coming out of Canton, Ohio and serving in World War II in Europe. So here to talk about home front to battlefront, Frank Lavin. Super. Well, thank you, Mike. Thank you very much for uh, your hospitality today. Thank you for that uh, warm introduction. I, I don't even know if I need this, uh, but we can we can speak directly. And thank, thanks to everybody here for uh, giving up some of your Sunday for this discussion. And I hope it. I use the word discussion. What I want to do is present and share a little uh, of, of the, the history with you, share a little from the book, and then I'd be very interested in comments and questions uh, you might have as well. Uh, as we start, I've got <coughs> several friends here from Singapore, but we have two distinguished guests here, the uh, ambassador of Singapore to the United States, Ashok Mapuri, and his wife, Puri. So uh, well and warm welcome to the ambassador. You should be aware, not, not, not surprising, as a former British colony, uh, Singapore has a Jewish community, uh, small in numbers, but, but vibrant and one that makes an active contribution to uh, civic life and economic life in uh, Singapore. So um, uh, it's always been a hospitable, multicultural, secular government that we all cherish. Uh, what, <coughs> what I propose to do is to talk a little bit about uh, the architecture, the story itself, and then read a few uh, selections from the book. And Mike uh, made a very important point in that gracious introduction. Uh, it's, it's about, the book is about 40% letters, about 60% history, and the letters are, are I think, very uh, telling uh, letters until you get into battle. And then the letters become a bit sterile and a bit um, uh, uneventful, and uh, you're in wartime censorship in a very dangerous situation. And I think Mike's exactly right. Um, nobody's going to share bad news with the family, and you don't have a mechanism to share bad news anyhow. So, so the letters become uh, less useful as a historical instrument. But uh, so we have to switch to other other sources for the sort of the <coughs> for the book itself. Let me. Let me take a minute then to give you that architecture uh, and tell you about um, what the book covers, uh, and then and then uh, and then we'll read those selections. Look, I, I want to begin with a uh, with a quote by John Steinbeck, who we know as a novelist uh, and playwright, but he was a war correspondent. He he covered the war in Europe. Uh, Steinbeck writes, "There are really two wars, and they haven't much to do with each other." There's a war of maps and logistics, of campaigns, of ballistics, armies, divisions, and regiments, and that is General Marshall's war. Then there's the war of the homesick, 
weary, funny, violent, common men who wash their socks in their helmets, complain about the food, and lug themselves in their spirit through as dirty a business as the world has ever seen, and do it with humor and dignity and courage. So this book is the second war. This book is just a human story. We got, we got a lot of that, I think, in the United States through the Ken Burns documentary about the human impact of the war. We, we saw it in Band of Brothers and other kind of stories, the Tom Hanks stories, <coughs> most recently Hacksaw Ridge, but it's that, that type of a story. So Carl Lavin, uh, as Mike indicated, was 17 years old, a high school senior in Ohio when Pearl Harbor's hit. He signs up when he turns 18, which is later in 1942. Interestingly, he's not called up right away, and I think that's the common experience for GIs. The U.S. Army goes from about 200,000 in 1940, peacetime army, to about 2 million in 1942. So it just takes months, if not years, to ramp up to full strength. Uh, he goes off to Miami, Miami of Ohio, if people are from there, as, as had originally been planned, uh, and he's in the Enlisted Reserve Corps on campus, a sort of an ROTC type organization where you have drills and a uniform, but there's no, no real duties. And it's not until 1943 that he's activated and he's sent to uh, Camp Hood, now Fort Hood, outside of Dallas for basic training and then for uh, specialized training. Specialist, specialist training then he's designated as a tank destroyer. So he goes through uh, basic and then tank destroyer school. But at the end of that process, which is only a few months, uh, he's admitted into another Army program. People here might be familiar with ASTP, Army Specialized Training Program, which is a program you can test into that'll put you back into a college setting. So he's, uh, <coughs> so he's able to get placed back into college and he's assigned, it's, it's a random assignment, he's assigned to Queens College in New York. And he's more or less in kind of a regular accelerated, it's a regular college program, it's on an accelerated basis, and it's all in uniform. But there's no, there's no military duties per se, he's just going to class. But that program only lasts six months or so, but it drags him until the spring of 44, when the program's more or less ended. Not, not, a, not completely ended, but more or less wrapped up in 44. The program's just abandoned because the U.S. is sending people into combat, and it's, it's deemed inappropriate and politic to have this sort of carve out for kids to go to college while their kids are being sent into combat. Uh, so then he's sent to uh, Camp Shelby in Hattiesburg, Mississippi. He's attached to the 69th. He's no longer a tank destroyer, but he's a barman, Browning automatic rifle, uh, which is the light machine gun that every squad's got. Uh, it's a light machine gun. It's a very heavy automatic rifle. Uh, and he's, he's with the 69th. He's with the 69th the summer of 44 at Hattiesburg. The fall of 44, several months after D-Day, they're, they're mobilized and they're sent to Britain, but they're a reserve division. So they're in Britain October, Southampton, the big port. Uh, they're, they're in Britain October, November. December, the Battle of the Bulge breaks out, Hitler's final offensive. Uh, <coughs> he is detached from the 69th on Christmas Day 1944. We remember this because the Jewish kids are serving the food at the Christmas banquet in the, in the mess hall and everybody has to report to barracks and all the riflemen of the 69th are stripped out. About 2,000 some people are stripped out and sent as replacements to active combat divisions. Uh, he's assigned to the 84th division. So, he, uh, so he's uh, lunch, lunch in Southampton and dinner at the front. Um, Southampton. He fights all the way through the 84th for the final six months. Uh, then he's in occupation, uh, mainly in Germany, one France assigned before he goes home in January 46. So that's, that's his uh, story. Let me, let me take you into uh, uh, <coughs> to some of these things, read, read uh, a few selections if I may. This is basic training. This is in Texas. Dear folks, here's what we did yesterday. Got up at 0500. 5 a.m. to you, which was not too unusual since we've been doing it every single day. <laughs> Reveille at 5.15 to 5.25, chow at 5.30 to about 5.50, then try to get washed, make your bed, clean out your barracks, prepare for inspection, put on your leggings, fill your canteen. The water's no good here and has to be medicated. And police the area in about 45 minutes. Then we march off to training area with pack and guns. Either a 1917 model Enfield or a Thompson submachine gun. From 0700 to 1100, we have classes of 50 minutes each. 
separated by two minute wind sprint, eight, eight minute rest period. The classes are on first aid and gas mostly so far, but we'll be having many more different ones. We just started motor maintenance and driving, and we've also had military courtesy, the Articles of War. I can be put up for life for not shining my shoes. Article of War 94, conduct not becoming a soldier. And map reading. Then there is an hour of drill and formation exercising. From 1200 to 1330, we eat, have a rest period, most of which is taken up waiting in line to get some food, waiting in line to get seconds, waiting in line to wash your mess gear. To 1730, we have uh, some more classes sometimes. Usually the last hour is spent doing something a little more exerting. Like yesterday, we had a hike. I believe I wrote before saying how hard it was marching three miles in 50 minutes with a pack in 85 degree heat. Well, yesterday we marched five miles in 45 minutes with a pack and rifle in 90 degree heat. Now, if you don't know how fast that is, there's a guy ahead of me who's about 5'5", five five and his legs weren't long enough to go that fast. He had to run about a third of the time. But the most fun of all was when we double timed the last 100 yards. Now, those marches are really the only thing I don't like about the Army. And I have a violent hatred of them. They are nothing but torture from the first step to the last. And there's no deeper discouragement than to have your leg muscles paining and your shoulders rub sore and come to some rough or sandy ground and realize you still have four more miles to go but can do absolutely nothing but continue to march and march to top speed. Then toward the end, your eyes start to smart from the sweat washing through them, and you hope you won't stumble because you're sure you won't be able to start up again. But the funny thing is, once you're back and you put down your pack and gun, the relief takes all the tiredness away, and you don't throw yourself down on your bunk as you so ardently desired out on the hike. You lay down for two or three minutes, drink a quart and a half of water usually, and start joking about the hike. The letter goes on. But that gives you a good sense. I got a, I got a sense from some of the audience about the people here. How many people here have been active duty? Good chunk. So, so it, it rings true, doesn't it? it? We've all sort of been there in some form or fashion. So it's not no surprise that, uh, that he sort of gets it and uh, no surprise that nobody likes uh, long distance hikes. Um, that's the nature of it. Then as we, as we mentioned, uh, uh, the, the book takes a turn as you go through these training assignments and so forth and into uh, combat. Uh, I'll give you a scene setter for the Battle of the Bulge. This is... Uh, this was a, uh, <coughs> this is by John Eisenhower, Ike's son, who was a Brigadier General and also a, uh, a historian. I might have just to lose that. Uh, talking about the Battle of the Bulge. It was the biggest single battle ever fought by the United States Army. More than 600,000 GIs were directly involved. 400,000 had supporting roles. This was more men than the entire U.S. Army of 1941. About 20,000 GIs were killed, another 20,000 captured, 40,000 wounded. This is more casualties than the total number of men in the Army of Northern Virginia at Gettysburg. Americans lost nearly 800 tanks, more than there had been in the entire U.S. Army in 1941. So massive scale, one million people involved in this activity. Um, <coughs> I'll read from the uh, tail end. <laughs> Soldiers were required to inspect every room and every building in the town, going through all houses, office buildings, and factories. Carl did his part, looking for people, looking for ammunition, looking for weapons. Well, usually two or three guys would go through a house together. You don't want to go in by yourself. There's always a little bit of a leery feeling as you went to open a door because if someone was in there and wanted to shoot you, he was in a perfect position to do it. So it was always a little bit of a nervous thing going in. Door was locked, you kick it in the door, you kick in so your boot hits right by the door handle. In one particular town, Carl and two others just finished going through a house in the suburban part of town. So they walked out the door, they heard gunfire. Um, Carl saw two other GIs just 10 yards away. They were taking aim at a group of about four German soldiers who were running across an open field in the woods, approximately a quarter of a mile away. Well, this is a perfect job for a barman. Carl could spray bullets, give the enemy two choices, you surrender or you get cut down by automatic fire. Carl began moving to assist the two GIs when he heard his sergeant's voice calling, hey, Lavin, Lavin. Carl recognized the voice. He stopped, turned around, looked. He, he didn't see anyone. The sergeant was there. Carl, the sergeant said, up here, up here. Carl looked up higher from a house next to the one Carl had just inspected. There was a window with horizontal and vertical bars in it, an arm sticking out through the bars, waving wildly. Carl couldn't see the bars. He assumed it was the sergeant, Sergeant Johnson, calling him. Come here, you get a good shot from here, Sergeant Johnson said. Well, yeah, Carl hollered back, the Germans are getting away. Sergeant Johnson said, I know, you have a perfect shot from up here. Get up here, get to the window, hurry, bring your bar, get up here quick. 
Now, Carl immediately recognized this to be a bad command because of the amount of time it would take him to run to the back of the house, find the hallway, locate the stairs, scramble up them. Carl knew by that time he joined his sergeant, the Germans would be in the woods. It would have taken two seconds to assist the rifleman, but now as a dutiful soldier, he had to obey his sergeant. He runs to the back of the house with his bars, as fast as he could. He found the sergeant firing his rifle through bars in a bathroom window. Just as Carl steps in the door, Sergeant John caught a bullet in the elbow, staggers back. He falls halfway backward toward Carl. Carl catches him best he can, ease him to the floor. Carl's job's now Johnson's safety. He drags him to the hallway in a half-sitting position to get him out of harm's way. Once there, Carl started looking at Johnson's wound, saw blood searching out of the elbow. An artery to be hit was pumping out a lot of blood. You could count Johnson's pulse by watching the blood spurt. Well, never mind me, Johnson said, get the Jerry's. Get the Jerry's. Carl's immediate reaction was to ignore him, but he had to do, obey and do as he told. The bullets were still streaming in through the same barred window. The bottom of the window was about three feet high, so Carl could crouch under it. He bobbed his head up and down, trying to get a view, hoping he didn't get a bullet in the forehead. What Carl saw was startling. It was two GIs, fellow soldiers, shooting at the window. Carl darted his head up once more for confirmation's sake when he felt a million bee stings all over his face. A bullet had hit one of the cross pieces of the metal bars in the window, peppering Carl's face and neck with rust and metal shards. Carl wasn't bleeding, he just experienced that heart-stopping moment when people realized they faced death from an inch away. So Carl had verified the shooters and recognized them. One GI was kneeling, one was standing, both were shooting at Carl through that window. They must have seen Johnson's rifle from the barred window, soon to be a German soldier, open fire on the window. Hey, Carl rushed back to Johnson, hey, those are our guys, they aren't Germans. They're our guys, they thought you were Jerry. Johnson gives it a moment of thought, changes his priorities, and says, get Smitty, get Smitty. Well, Smitty was the squad medic. Smitty always said, never yell medic. Make sure you yell Smitty, and I'll run as fast as I can to come to help. I don't want to get diverted helping someone else. Carl rushed downstairs to get Smitty. He stopped as soon as he arrived at the door. He didn't want to be shot by his own man. So he took off his helmet, full field pack. He dropped his bar. He threw down his ammunition to make himself as light as possible. Carl bolted from the door, hoping his men recognized him before they filled him with bullet holes. And it worked. No one shot. They recognized Carl's helmet was off. They were all hiding in bushes around the edge of the yard. They started yelling, hey, Lavin, Lavin, get down, get down. Jerry's in there. Carl, you're like, no, not Jerry's. That was Johnson to me inside. He said, are you crazy? Are you telling me it was you and J Johnson shooting at us? No, no, that was Johnson shooting over your head. Johnson's hurt. Get Smitty. Johnson's hurt. Get Smitty. Carl was yelling as loud as he can. The GI started shouting for G Smitty, who decided the fastest way to get to the scene was to jump a fence. Unfortunately, Smitty's foot caught a rail and went sailing with his medical equipment being thrown loose. Through the air went the morphine cyrets, the sulfonamide, the gauze bandages, the compresses, the surgical tape, the tincture, methylate, aspirin, bismuth, paragoric, sodium amytal, and tags for logging morphine injections. The GIs helped Smitty pick up his gear. Come on, Johnson's hurt. Stop fooling around. Come on. It was one, one episode from, from the battle. Um, let, me, uh, let me read one more, if I may. We can, we can go to questions. This is late. This is late. This is April. April 45, I mean. So, the war was essentially over. What was required in those final days was caution, planning, and steady progress. Yet the captain of Carl's company called a meeting to tell his GIs he had volunteered them for a mission. The company was not at full strength. It had fewer than 100 men. World War II companies typically close to about 150, so you're somewhere below two-thirds strength. The men were to take the village of Gartau from the resisting German soldiers who had successfully repelled a different American company the previous day. The captain proudly told the GIs that there had been a regimental meeting at which the colonel had asked for volunteers for the Gartau mission. I'm so proud of you, the captain said. Carl recalled he and all the GIs were thinking, well, you sorry son of a gun. You are thinking glory with our guts. There was no enthusiasm this late in the war for heroics. But the order had come down. <clears throat> and the next day, Carl and his company were sent to take the village, located about a mile away from their current position. The idea was that a rapid frontal assault without any artillery support would allow the infantry to surprise the village defenders. Carl's company made a stealthy running attack across some level fields. Carl's carrying 40 or 50 pounds more than anyone else. Couldn't run as fast, but doing the best he could. Near the village, the troops reached barbed wire fencing, which was affixed to metal poles. The men used the poles to leap over the wire. When Carl got to the fence, he props his bar on the other side of the wire and begins to climb over. The moment he put down his weapon, all hell broke loose. The Germans had been watching the GIs advance all along and had previously ranged all of their weapons to the fence. 
knowing the GIs would have to congregate there to cross. Indeed, once the company reached the fence, they were a perfect target. Germans had let loose with machine gun and rifle fire, some mortars, tremendous amount of ammunition spent. <coughs> Carl immediately hit the ground. Because he had just placed his weapon across the fence, he was weaponless. It seemed like the entire company, except for Carl, was shooting back. Worse, the Germans could recognize the bar direct fire at Carl's position. As the fighting started to shift to one side of the field, Carl was able to clear the fence, grab his gun, follow the momentum of the action, which was sending the fight to the left side of the village. Carl's running, hit the ground in short spurts, up and run, hit the ground, up and run, and hit the ground. Fire was so intense, GIs are scattering or falling to the ground, wounded or dead. Moving to the left, Carl could see GIs are seeking coverage in a drainage ditch, half filled with icy water. Carl jumped in the ditch, about a half dozen other guys from his company. They were up to their waist in icy water, but the ditch allowed them to keep their heads while taking in the situation. Carl and GIs were quick to observe the Germans fighting from foxholes and trenches. A few GIs stayed in the drainage ditch. Carl and a few others were to follow the ditch into town. Once in Gartau, a sergeant pointed Carl to a barn-like structure, told him to see if he could find a firing position inside. Carl shoots the padlock off the building, found a type of office on a second floor. That gave him a vantage point which to shoot down on the German foxholes. Then the, this is a uh, recording Carl gave to an oral history project. I was at the second store window. I saw a German trying to cross an open field, running in the direction of where the main action was. I took a quick shot at him while he was running to slow him down. It works because he hits the ground on a plain open field. Well, I thought that was pretty dumb because he just lies there and he doesn't move. Well, then I tried to decide what to do. He's mine and I could have him if I wanted. I decided I would kill him. He's not surrendering. I didn't want to kill him. Do I really want to take a human life after having just shot at him and he's just lying there? Well, I decided this is a hell of a time to become a conscientious objector. I finally said, yeah, I would kill him. I'm ashamed to admit the final reason this would be an opportunity to have the experience of positively killing someone known that I killed. I wouldn't have to wonder anymore what it felt like to kill somebody, so I did it. I just shot him. He never moved. I've had a queasy experience about it ever since. It's the only absolute time I ever positively know I killed someone. We had a patrol going out the next day, went right by the guy I killed. He never moved a muscle. Head down, I picked up his head and felt brains and gore. What it really meant, the position of the head and position of the body, was that my first quick shot where I tried to slow him down, it actually hit him in the head. I know it had to have been my first shot because he never moved when he hit the ground. So all the time I was trying to decide whether I'd take his life or shouldn't I, in fact, I'd already taken his life. Well, this has struck him with me strongly ever since. So that was the second vivid combat moment. 